right, guys. Welcome to this month's culinary hour. Um, today we're going to cover um, Middle Eastern countries. Um, this today I picked um, in the celebration of our uh, CEO's birthday, Karen Zolo. So, so if you look on your first page of your handouts, okay, a um, little couple of facts here. Middle East has been cultural and geographical crossroads and midpoint of the Euro, Asia, African world, meaning the three continents is pretty much centered in there, which consequently renders it a hub of culinary exchange. Uh, spice trade routes, anything of that nature, would have to necessarily go through the Mideast. So anything from Europe, Asia, and Africa, the crossroads are kind of like in the centralized in the Mideast, obviously, Middle East. So um, they picked up a lot of different influences of other cultures. It's important to view the fair of the Middle East as it evolved with the entire region, ignoring present day political boundaries. Known as the cradle of civilization, the Fertile Crescent is flanked by the Nile River to the west and the Tigris and Euphrates to the east. You probably remember that in grade school, Mesopotamia area, the Fertile Crescent. So that's what they thought, like even in the Bible, they considered the Garden of Eden was in that area uh, because it was so fertile. You don't think of the deserts as it is now. At one point in time, it was a very fertile region. It's flanked by the Nile River to the west and the Tigris and Euphrates to the east. In the heart of the Middle East are Saudi Arabia, Israel, Jordan, Iraq, Bahrain, Iran, Qatar, Syria, Tunisia, United Arab, United Arab Emirates, and other nations of predominantly Arab peoples. To the north and moving west are Lebanon, Turkey, Greece, and Crete. Moving to the south are Egypt and Sudan. The recipes native to each region differ based upon the availability of ingredients from the past. It all depended upon what was regionally traded and what was offered in the marketplace. Middle Eastern food today is definitely defined by its past. Simplicity of Middle Eastern cuisine allows for a diet meant to sustain life through harsh conditions. Some 12,000 years ago, hunters became farmers and wheat was first cultivated, followed by barley, pistachios, figs, pomegranates, dates, and other regional staples. Fermentation was also discovered and was used not only to make beer, but also to leaven bread. Around 700 AD, tribal wars brought portable foods of Arab warriors, such as figs, dates, and nuts, to other lands. Portable food meaning something you could eat and nourish yourself, you don't have to worry about spoilage. So they would dry the fruits and things like that, nuts of that nation, they would carry in the box so they have like a good source of protein with the nuts, vitamins and minerals from the figs and the dates. So you have like a nice portable food, you don't have to worry about spoiling. <clears throat> as time passed, more influences fell upon the region. Persians, who occupied present-day Iran, developed their own cuisine using fresh fruits, rice, and poultry, laying the foundation for the Middle Eastern cuisine that is similar, that is familiar today. A synthesis of influences and exotic spices Arab traders were procuring from the Orient. As time progressed, more influences fell upon the region, introduced by Turkey's Ottoman Empire. They brought, among other foods, the sweet pastries of paper-thin filo dough and the dense sweet coffee, drunk nowadays throughout the Middle East. Other countries who left their mark include yogurt from Russians, dumplings from the Mongol invaders, turmeric, cumin, garlic, and other spices from India, cloves, peppercorns, and allspice from the Spice Islands, okra from Africa, and tomatoes from the New World via the Moors of Spain. Just as Buddhism plays a hand in determining the diets of many Asian countries, so do the religions of the Middle East. Lamb is a main meat eaten as both the Jewish and Muslim face forbid eating of pork. They also eat beef, too, and poultry, to a good extent. A traditional meal will commence with the appetizer. I'm going to pronounce it really. It's mezze? sounds good. Mezze? Yeah. <laughs> Many tiny dishes, including baba ganoush. Uh, baba ganoush is like an eggplant with a, uh, kind of like a, a hummus, but it has like a uh, roasted eggplant kind of texture to it. Um, hummus, uh, boric, is a feta stuffed field pastries, and dolmas. Dolmas are uh, stuffed grape leaves. Uh, Greeks call them dolmates, dolmates. The main course may include falafels, which is basically chickpea flour that are deep fried. Kebabs of lamb or chicken, koresh, lamb stew in a sweet and sour sauce, or a variety of rice dishes mixed with meats, fruits, and nuts. Salads, vegetables, and bread will accompany any meal. Tabule, uh, this is a bulgur wheat salad. There's a parsley bulgur tomato salad. Sauteed eggplant tomatoes with yogurt and spinach are popular side dishes. For dessert, expect a thick, sweet cup of coffee coupled with a nut-filled with nut-filled desserts like baklava, honey-sweet pastries, and almond-crusted cookies. 
Okay, some certain facts at, at the Middle East. Accepted sign that a guest has enjoyed the meal is licking one's fingers. Not so much taken upon uh, social norm today, but there, like, you lick your fingers, a guest they basically enjoy the meal. Uh, they want to get every last bit of it. The word gourmet did not originate in France. It is derived from the Farsi word for new. I'm sorry, for stew, gourmet. A pita bread is considered to be the oldest bread in the world. McDonald's has their own version of falafel on their menu in Egypt called the McFalafel. <laughs> <laughs> They're everywhere. The eggplant is the most consumed vegetable in the Middle East. Ancient Egyptians used the Arab fenugreek as an embalming fluid. Today it is used in cooking and in teas. The fava beans, you've probably seen the fava beans, the long pod, and when you break the pod open, you still have to take each bean out of its shell. Fava bean was once condemned because it was thought to contain the souls of dead people. Oh. Saffron is the most expensive herb in the world. Now, saffron is used, I talked about this once before, saffron is a herb derived from the stamen of the crocus. Um, what happens is it's so expensive because they're hand picked and you have to look for the direct, as soon as it's ripe, you gotta pick it and you gotta manufacture it. What happens is saffron is used, has a very herbal, nice floral essence to it. Uh, it's used for yellowing agent, but you also use turmeric too, which I'll talk about later on. Turmeric is actually the, I think it's a little rhizome of a ginger plant. Um, so they grind that too for a yellowing of rice, but it does not definitely have that nice floral effect that saffron does. But by the time it hits the stores, it ranges from $600 to $1,000 per pound. It is normally sold by the ounce or gram in markets. <laughs> Today, we are going to talk about this Megaluba. Go to the next page. Um, you're gonna, I'm going to talk about like uh, preparing a lot of this. You're going to see me fabricate a lot of simple food. It's a very, it's a very simple in nature. Uh, most Middle Eastern food is, except the fact is, you got to take time with each preparation, each layer. Um, you have eggplant, you're going to have tomato, you're going to have onion, and each one has to deserve its own time, so sort of thing. So we don't prep each one separately. So basically, instead of taking this and making a better stew, the whole thing, what I want to do is fabricate each piece that I have, season it, and cook it as we go along. Make a layer. It's basically kind of like a. Uh, think of it as like a shepherd's pie, if you will. Layers of different flavors, um, all cooked at once at the end and served all together. So I'm going to start first. Go to the recipe. Uh, two eggplants, long grain rice, fine egg noodles, boneless, skinless chicken thighs, onion, peppercorn, bay leaves. I use a low sodium chicken broth. A soybean olive oil blend, cauliflower head, uh, melted butter. I only use the melted butter really to um, Use the side of the pan where I'm going to make the final dish. It has like a richness to it more than just olive oil, olive oil would do. Uh, tomato sliced thick, garlic, turmeric, cinnamon, allspice, fresh ground black pepper, crushed red pepper, bada, pine nuts, and lemon wedges. Um, you'll see the recipe follows. Um, that butter is, is a term that's given to a uh, special spice blood. The one I use might be different than somebody else's because it's regional in, in Middle Eastern cuisine. Just like uh, if you go down south, Somebody's Creole seasoning might have a little more cayenne pepper or a little more garlic than somebody else does. Um, but this one I particularly use. Um, it actually has kind of like a little more of a Palestinian influence in it because I had, um, I've made this um, seasoning before a couple times. Uh, the addition of mint and oregano has a nice, a subtle sweetness to it to kind of counteract the spiciness to it. So if you look on the second page, you'll see my recipe for the Baharat, which I have right here. You want to pass it around? When it does get the last person, I'd like that back, so I'll need it for this thing. <laughs> so anything that, you're, anything that you're smelling is the actual recipe that you see on that last page here. Because the first rule I'm going to work on the bench. Some decor, cauliflower. So what you want to do is like, I like to use my hands basically and kind of work with it because the center core can be kind of tough. I'm working basically just to get the florets. So I'm going to break these up in little florets here. Once you get past the central core, I'm kind of looking for pieces about ranging about this size. When you break the whole head of cauliflower down. <clears throat> okay, 
The next stage, eggplant, one of the most eaten vegetables in the Mideast. Um, what I'm going to do, just to expedite for the sake of today, is I typically like to, eggplant has like an astringency in the, in the vegetable. Sometimes you eat it, it kind of like curls your tongue, almost like stings your, stings your palate a little bit. What I typically like to do is, I'm going to about a quarter inch rounds. For the time being here. I like to salt them. Now what that does, it extracts a lot of the um, astringent nature of the vegetable. So the reason why I'm doing this, doing this kind of early, I want to let it sit for a while in salt. And salt being very anhydrous has a tendency um, to suck all that kind of astringent juice aside. You'll see later on as it sits there, you have like little beads on top of the eggplant. Um, even if you swipe your finger over, you'll taste salty, but you have that astringent that kind of goes away. And also, it renders a texture of the eggplant that's more, I don't want to say leathery, but it's easier to um, manipulate. If I had this and retained a lot of the moisture in it, and I sauteed it, it would break apart a lot easier. But as I'm salting it, what it's doing is eliminating a lot of the moisture without cooking, and it gives them a much firmer texture. So I'm gonna put these on the side here. You know what I'm going to do next is my tomato. The tomato's really gonna be just like a finishing ingredient in the beginning. It's only about quarter inch rounds here. Okay, the first thing I want to do, always season as you go. So what I'm going to do, pan nice and hot. Put on the back. On the side you're going to see, also the recipe calls for a chicken stock. What I like to do instead of straining, I like to make what they call a bouquet garni. Take a piece of cheesecloth. In the bouquet garni it calls for peppercorns, and bay leaf. So what I do is I don't have to worry about straining it. I take my peppercorn. A couple more. Not that much. And bay leaf. And I get some butcher's twine. What this does is infuse my chicken stock. I don't have to worry about straining out the bay leaf and the peppercorns later. So I'm going to fold it full of corners, give it a good twist. This works well with stocks anyway if you're using like fresh um, parsley stems, even garlic if you don't have to worry about like uh, straining out a stock. Put this right in your chicken stock is cooking in the back, throw it in the back. What happens is you're kind of like steeping like you would a tape. If it's a deep pot, just wrap your string around here and tie it off. And when it's in, after it infuses about 15 minutes, all you have to do is pull that sachet out and the stock is infused with all those herbs. You have to worry about the straining of it. So here, I got this pan nice and hot. Cauliflower's going. And as always, season as you go, a little salt and pepper. And this pin over here, I'm going to start my eggplant. What you really want to do is kind of, in any saute, you're looking for the nice browning of your product, which you're looking for to get rid of that rawness, that astringency that happens in the cauliflower. It's one they call like one of those cruciferous vegetables. It's like, like the cabbage, I think, that had a smell. You probably smell it right now in the air. Um, you want to kind of eliminate that for the most part, eliminate the water that comes with it, but you want to caramelize all those sugars to intensify the flavor of that vegetable. That's why I directly go with the raw veg in this pan, because I know 
full well later on. I'm not so worried about the interior texture being hard because I know I'm going to finish this up in the oven if you read the directions for that with the rice and the stock is going to be finishing the oven for another 30 minutes. So that water is going to help cook the remainder of the vegetables the rest of the way. That's inclusive for the cauliflower and the eggplant. On the um, bottom directions too, it calls for fine egg noodles. They require a little browning. What that does is it caramelizes the flour and gives a very nutty flavor to the noodles. So if you go in the store, you'll see them. Instead of the white egg noodles, you get the very fine. I'll show you a little bit what it looks like. It's uh, right here. Egg noodles are very cut very fine, like almost like a, a little smaller than a spaghetti would be. So we're going to kind of toast them in the oil as well. As you can see, there's a lot of preparation involved before the dishes even started, but once all the things are cooked and ready to go, you can see it's just like a layering effect, and you're just doing a final cook in the oven. You gotta watch these because they brown real quick. pan ready. What I'm going to do here is get a little whole butter. And what I'm going to do is put the sides pretty liberally in the bottom. And I start the layering process. What I do first would be tomatoes. What you want to do is kind of like uh, concentric rings going around the bottom of the pan. Like that. I don't know if you can see it, kind of like got the tomatoes pushed in there, kind of. Things like that. has an affinity for being one of those vegetables that really soaks up oil, so I kind of add as I go along, so it doesn't get too oily. So I'm 
kind of look like a caramelization on the eggplant. Like that, a little darker. Uh, that'd be the next layer that you involve here. Proceed with the cauliflower. Okay, at this point in time, all the vegetables have been incorporated. What I want to do is compact it pretty tight as much as I can. And you'll see for the amount of rice I use, there's really not that much um, stock because cauliflower is still a bit raw. Eggplant is going to render a little moisture too, as well, and plus oils that are in there too, as well. So I really don't want to add too much to the rice um, mixture as it would normal peel off. The peel off, I probably do. For every one cup of rice, I do one and a half cups of liquid. It's almost like one on one with this because I have rice and noodles obviously going in here together, which will absorb, but I'm also want to assimilate all the vegetable juices that are going to be extracted to the cooking process too. So you don't have to add that much, otherwise you have like a, too much of a moist, the rice going to cook away when you see the rice. Just trying to just push this down a little bit. At this point, Tommy's the rice. Um, toasted egg noodles. And garlic. You always got garlic. <coughs> kind of like to make a paste with the salt that's on the cutting board. Let's break it down a lot faster. previously cooked and caramelized like you do the other vegetables. And then the rice, toasted noodle mixture, and garlic would be the last layer. And what you want to do is kind of push it down, compact it. Like that. Now, the broth that's remaining, this has been steeped. So what I want to do at this point, uh, my seasonings, that, um, is the mixture still around? The bottom of those back? Oh, thank you. So this is kind of like in the spice mix. I'm going to eyeball this for a little bit. I know kind of what I need, based upon the amount. So you look at that bottom recipe, I'm going to take some of that. But what, at this point in time, I want to augment that. I want to yellow the rice a little bit. I want to give a little more sweetness to it without having sugar. So this is where the cinnamon, the turmeric, the allspice come in right here, and the red pepper. A little heat. And the red pepper. The turmeric. Allspice and cinnamon rice. Are you guys getting smaller yet? Smells good. Yes. Get in there. I just do a quick whisk. This point in time, we want to do. This is a point where you just want to watch it. You don't want to have too much liquid, just enough. Cover the top of the rice. Push it down, come 
impact it. So if you see when you pour the liquid that it goes down, go back with your spoon and push on it. Because I guarantee you the, 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 uh, the uh, stock will come to the surface and you'll see just enough to barely cover the rice. Just go, if you need a little more than so, obey it. Add a little bit less in the beginning. I can tell you I probably need like a little, not even half a cup. So at this point in time, if you're raw rice, you semi raw vegetables. And typically what you do at this point in time, bring it on top of the stove top. Now as soon as that comes to a simmer, you're gonna see the water breaking the surface bubbling. You turn that down. What I like to do is, some people like to fish on the stove top. Um, I like my rice in the oven because I like the heat generated from all sides. It renders a more fluffy rice. So after that comes to a simmer, I would cover this with foil, put it in the oven about 350 for about a half hour, and then pull it out and let it sit for about 10 minutes. And then it's pretty much done. Now traditionally this is gonna be served with a yogurt sauce with a touch of cucumber, which I have today. It's kind of like along the lines of a tzatziki you might have with a hero. I think that's going to serve that right now for you. Um, any questions? You can use different meats, right? Not just chicken. Yes, you can. Um, lamb is typically used. You can use lamb. Um, especially like lamb recipes. Lamb and beef are like interchanged very easily with any of these recipes, you know? Um, the one thing I forgot was that. <laughs> Good question. Chicken. <laughs> He's smart. <laughs> so, yeah. so what happened was, hold on, before that rice goes in. <laughs> That's your vegetarian option? No. It could be. Actually, it could be. Very easily. Um, before that rice goes in, the thigh meat would go on top of that cauliflower layer, and the rice would go on top. But thank you, because we're sitting right there, and I totally missed it. Um, I think that's what it is. But um, this is just like the thigh meat that was like seasoned with that barat seasoning, and I roasted it off. Um, so. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? No. Are you going to pour more of the uh, stock in there? Or? I don't need it. Um, let me show you. It's not going to be Pass this around a little bit. What you do is um, you're going to render, I don't know if you can see it. That's all you really want. Just to cover the rice a little bit. But mm -hmm. Can you cover it? You can steam it all. So. This is barely covering it. Now, if the meat was in there, you can see something there. <laughs> okay, so what I have now is I made a big monster pot of this. This is pretty much it right here. So I'm going to portion it I was going to try to be like heroic and try to flip it. But I felt better of it. So I'm not going to do that. Oh, this does have chicken in it too, just so you know. What I'm going to do is a final garnish. Um, serve with lemon wedges, pine nuts, and a little yogurt sauce. So you get a little bit of that too for service. Mm. Can you kind of smell all the herbs? Oh, yeah. you come yeah. in? Our clothes used to smell like that when we were kids. Oh. <laughs> so lucky. No. <laughs> oh, mom, don't make that again. Put this here. The toasted pine nuts. Final dish, right? Any questions? There's 
traditional drink that you would serve with that? I mean, my traditional drink, or? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Like, I've read a lot of things, but there are cultures that's like, um, alcohols are like normally consumed if you're follows the Quran and things like that. So, I mean, uh, there's Arabian tea. Uh, yeah, tea, yeah, tea and coffee, right? Mint tea. Care with no man. There you go. Mint tea. Mint tea. All right, Sam, you have something to say? Well, um, it is Karen's birthday. So if you guys wouldn't mind singing happy birthday to our oh, yeah. and administrator. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Karen. Happy birthday to you. In the culture, traditionally, like when they put those big plates of rice out, usually there's like two or two of those for the men and two for the, the women, because uh, they they eat in separate rooms just so they can be comfortable. And then uh, the men would eat with their hands and grab and make yeah and eat it and consume it. Then lick their fingers. No, I don't know. About that. <laughs> yeah, some do. Yeah, yeah, just so they be comfortable and like and eat. And you traditionally dump it out so it stays lighter, or do you just yeah, you, you dump it out, and everything on the bottom is on top. But it's not like on TV; it comes out a little sloppier. Yeah. 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 Eric, what my mom used to do, she took out like half the rice, and then would flip it. She took out because the top half is usually rice, right? Yeah. And then she, so she, t she did a shortcut, took that part out, and then flipped it. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, so just this top. So it's easier, okay. <laughs> Eric, what are we doing next month? Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I think I'm going to do two parts on France. Okay. I want all the cauliflower. Two parts? Like, I, I, I never covered France. Two months, two months in a row? Two months in a row, I think I'm going to cover France. Because I never really did that. Who's that? That's mine. Yours, you want to cover? Okay. Okay, this is yours, okay.